I'm interested in the twin prime conjecture. So this is asking about consecutive prime numbers. P1 as the first prime, which would be equal to 2. And there'll be the second prime, P2, which will be equal to 3. And you can look at the gaps between the primes. So the gap between 3 and 2 is 1. This is the only time where you can possibly have two prime numbers which differ by exactly 1. And so the next smallest possible gap would be a gap of size 2. It's certainly not the case that all gaps become of size 2, but the question is how many of these gaps are of size 2? So, for example, 101 and 103 are two rather larger prime numbers which differ by exactly 2. And then the twin prime conjecture says that this having two primes which differ by exactly 2 happens infinitely often. If the twin prime conjecture was false, at some point you go along the number line and then all prime gaps would always be bigger than 2. But we don't believe that's the case. We believe that it should be the case that the twin prime conjecture is correct. So no matter how far you go along, there's always going to be some bigger primes, and in fact infinitely many bigger primes, that differ by just exactly 2. So you can test this on a computer, and we found pairs of primes that differ by exactly 2 with over 300,000 decimal digits. And in fact, they're surprisingly common. That It's certainly not all the time, but if you look at the first how far you have to go after a million to find a pair of twin primes, it's not very far. If you look after a billion, it's not very far. If you look after a thousand billion, it's actually not very far until you start finding twin primes. Most primes aren't going to have the one after it being just two apart, but we still believe that these should be relatively plentiful, and so far if you check it on a computer, this seems to be true, but whether it's really true all the way as far as you go is something that you can't check on a computer, and that's where you need to try and prove a real mathematical result. So we don't actually know how old the twin prime conjecture is, that some people have claimed that it should go all the way back to Euclid, and it's certainly the kind of question that the ancient Greeks could easily have thought about. The l most recent time where we've seen someone really write down the conjecture officially was just over 100 years ago by de Ponignac, but he actually conjectured a rather stronger, more general form of the twin prime conjecture that's a bit more complicated. It's not just gaps of size 2, but also gaps of size 4 and gaps of size 6. And so there's a suspicion that the twin prime conjecture itself is rather older than that, but we know it's at least 100 years old, possibly thousands of years old. If we're still finding these things way, way down the number line, and we know there are an infinite number of primes, this is a known thing, if they did stop, what would stop them occurring? Like, what is there some, what beast out there could stop twin primes occurring? It doesn't seem there's any roadblock to them happening forever. This is one of the interesting and frustrating things about prime numbers, that often it's clear what the right answer should be. If you give me a simple problem like the twin prime conjecture, you can think about it heuristically a bit, you can check it on a computer, and you can quite quickly convince yourself that this should clearly be the right answer, and you can do it in a fairly confident way. So lots of problems about prime numbers. We believe we know what the correct answer should be, it's just that we don't know how to prove it, and the game is always trying to rule out there being some very bizarre conspiracy amongst prime numbers that um, would mean that they would behave in a rather different way to how we believe that they should behave. So you're completely right that if the twin prime conjecture was false, there'll be some strange switch that happens at some strange point far down the number line. There's an absolutely huge breakthrough by Yiteng Zhang just relatively recently in 2013, who showed that although he couldn't prove the twin prime conjecture that two is a gap infinitely often, and he similarly couldn't prove that four is a gap infinitely often, he showed that either two or four or six or eight or some number less than 70 million has to be a gap infinitely often. So the gap wasn't 70 million, it was just somewhere between two and 70 million, but he didn't know what it was. Right, he couldn't say which one of these came as a gap, but he was able to show that at least one of these occurs as a gap infinitely often. And 70 million might sound like a huge number to most people. It's certainly a lot bigger than two, for example. But before that, we had no idea of being at how we could possibly prove anything like this. Um, that he showed that no matter how far you go down the number line, there's always these primes that get clumped bizarrely close together. Because when you start looking at really, really, really big prime numbers, prime numbers become quite rare. So if you're looking at numbers with billions and billions of decimal digits, for example, then suddenly the average gap will be well over a billion. And if you look at even bigger ones, you get even bigger gaps. So typically prime numbers will have these very big gaps. And he showed that no matter how far you go down the number line, you always get these pairs that come 
really close together, um, at least compared to how they typically look. I guess earlier on in around 2005, there was this earlier work of Goldson, Pintz and Yodiram, who came up with a new method for thinking about the twin prime conjecture and problems closely related to it. People worked really hard to try and push Goldson, Pintz and Yodiram's ideas a little bit further, but there seemed to be this big obstacle that we kept on not being able to make progress on, and it was this problem which Yi Tang Zhang managed to break through came as a complete shock to everyone, I think, precisely because people had worked so hard on this particular approach and all the experts had been completely stumped on this. So 70 million is a slightly arbitrary mark number that just comes out of the method. And in fact, his method really just showed some number and he didn't try and optimize the 70 million too much. So if you take exactly his arguments, but you're ever so slightly more careful with the numerical calculations, uh, you can bring 70 million down to 30 million. And then if you tweak his arguments and rearrange things ever so slightly, it's still fundamentally the same argument as what he had, but you can bring 30 million down to 20 million. And so as soon as Yi Teng Zhang's result came out, there was this huge excitement at the result and trying to understand the result, but there also became a small online competition amongst mathematicians as to how low can you make the gap. That we knew 70 million was an upper bound, this is the first time we had a finite bound, but we also knew that by tweaking the arguments, you should be able to bring 70 million down to some smaller number. How low could you go just using what he had put out there and, and putting in the extra work? So there was a polymath project, which was a big online collaborative project that was set up precisely to try and optimize the arguments in Zhang's work. Now, they came up actually with quite a lot of neat ideas to make Zhang's argument as efficient as possible. They were able to bring Zhang's bound of 70 million down to, I think, 4,680. So I'd actually been thinking about a completely separate approach to this bound of gaps problem uh, before Zhang's work came out. So I was super excited that Zhang's work came out. It was fascinating for me because I was a still a PhD student at the time. Excited um, or disappointed? Like, did you feel like, oh no, I've been beaten? Or were you really excited? So I never had any belief that my ideas would lead to bound of gap screen primes in any way. So I was just excited. I think you're always super excited when you suddenly one of these big results comes out and you know that collectively we understand something new about prime numbers. And so I was just desperate to get into the details of Zhang's work. There's always this, um, intense frustrating game that you play when you're doing mathematics that you sort of feel that you have an idea but you don't quite know exactly how it fits in and it takes a long time of fumbling around in the darkness before you really get an intuition for how what you're thinking about works. It's a huge motivation to me that this is part of the fun, it's the chase of the problem and trying to understand what's going on. So I was still completely addicted to this thing that I'd been working on um, and I viewed it as a side benefit that it might actually be able to help this big collaborative project if I could sort my ideas out. But then the huge surprise to me was that actually once I managed to grasp a hold of this and look at things in, from the right perspective, uh, a variation on the ideas that I was thinking about uh, were able to prove banner gaps in a completely different way to Zhang's work. This gave a completely new way of proving banner gaps between primes. So both my work and Zhang's work is very much based on the earlier work of Goldson, Pintz and Yodiram. And Goldson, Pintz and Yodiram used an argument that's fundamentally using a technique known as sieve methods. They proved a great result about primes which come close together. And they said, if we could prove this other technical result that isn't to do with sieve methods, then we'd be able to get bound of gaps between primes. And so what Zhang managed to do is essentially prove something like what they wanted to prove and therefore use their argument to get bound of gaps between primes, whereas my approach was based on their original ideas, rethinking some of the way their original argument worked, which meant that you didn't need such a um, strong technical input, and so I could use weaker results that had been known for the past 50 years or so instead. On the one hand, I tend to sort of feel my way to a proof and know it's right before I actually write down all the details. So I did have this feeling that, yes, this has the feeling of being right, but at the same time, I remember <laughs> being pretty scared when I first came up with the ideas because you know I was going to be very much putting myself out there and it's very important for mathematicians to really be strict with themselves to check that they've got all the details right but you often have this internal feeling about these things and it felt right to me.
I was really surprised. So yeah, there was suddenly lots and lots of interest. I was a postdoc at the time in Montreal when this came out and suddenly I was getting invitations to fly all over um, to give talks in different places in the US. So it was really exciting for me being able to meet all these famous mathematicians, give talks on my work. Suddenly everyone was very excited. I hadn't really expected this at all. I thought, you know, I was pleased that I'd proven a nice result, but I was more pleased because I'd finally managed to get an understanding of these things and I, get, I had the satisfaction of the proof. I hadn't really expected there to be any um, media interest or all these people asking me to give talks and things. So some people have called it the Maynard Tao method. So Terry Tao was also thinking about similar ideas. He was very actively involved in leading this polymath project. And so he came up with essentially the same method at the same time. It was another bizarre coincidence that there, were, there was this one proof by Yiteng Zhang that came out and then both Terry and I came up with um, this new alternative method. So some people have been calling it the Maynard Tao method. So the current state of the art, trying to optimize all these techniques, including with this new method and these new ideas, is that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by no more than 246. We expect that every even number um, between two and 246 occurs as a difference. In particular, we expect two, but we know there's at least one between 2 and 246. Can your method get us to 2? Unfortunately, there's um, a fundamental barrier to our method getting us equal to 2. So in some later work, we said that if you were really optimistic about how you could maybe get all the technical stages of the argument to fit together, and if you were able to prove these other very strong results that were sort of strong versions of what Yiteng Zhang managed to prove, then maybe you can just about push our method to get gaps of size at most six infinitely often. But we also showed that there's not going to be any small variation on these sorts of ideas that can really get down to two. So you can get close to two, but not quite all the way. There's a new idea that's needed to get all the way to the twin prime conjecture for sure. The reason for it is that we have these mathematical devices that are trying to detect prime numbers, but they don't work perfectly. They're only approximately detecting prime numbers. So maybe they get it like one in 10 of the time or one in six of the time or something like that. And if you're getting it like one in 10 of the time, then maybe if you're looking for primes that come close together, you miss a whole load of the in-between primes, but you still find two that are pretty close together. Um, so you've maybe missed out 10 of them, but on the 10th one you find one and they're maybe 10 times further apart than you would have hoped, but they're still pretty close together. No variation on these techniques, even if you're really optimistic, uh, can ever improve your way of finding primes to one in two without using some extra arithmetic information and really a big new idea. The fact that your proof has this trait to it, that it involves approximation and things that aren't always right, doesn't sound like what I imagine a mathematical proof is. It already sounds like it's a bit hand wavy and wishy washy. Like, how can it this be one of these classic rigorous proofs if it's like sometimes a bit wrong? Um, right, so this is actually a common feature of lots of modern mathematics that you'll maybe take inspiration from probability or engineering and you still have to write down a rigorous mathematical proof but you maybe think about the whole approach in a heuristic way um, in a much less rigorous sense. And so you might think about lots of randomness in your problem and you might be deliberately trying to model prime numbers as random objects and think about them as not always being definitive and things being a bit approximate here and there. Um, and when you write down your argument, you have to write it down in a very rigorous way but all the intuitive ideas for why you come up with that argument in the first place are uh, often taken inspiration from rather separate areas of um, mathematics and science. Are you trying to find that breakthrough that will take us to two? Or do you feel like you've made your contribution and that's going to come from another part of math? Or are you in the hunt still? Um, I would certainly still love to uh, prove the twin prime conjecture or something like that. And I do think about it um, on Friday afternoons and things that Somehow there's a big new idea that's needed, and at the moment, collectively, I think we don't really have a clue as to how to go about that. Someone needs to come up with an idea, and it's good to have these problems in the back of your mind because sometimes your subconscious just comes up with a good idea out of nowhere. 
So I like to think about it on and off, but I'm not working full time on the twin prime conjecture now, just because at the moment I don't have a plausible approach to how to get over the current barriers. I still get my main motivation from the problems themselves, and I would certainly claim uh, I haven't, I don't feel terribly affected by the outside interest. The reason that I want to understand things about prime numbers is because I'm fascinated by prime numbers and I really want to get into the grips of the mathematical dirty details and do this. Although I know that there's lots of good reasons for being interested in prime numbers more generally for applications in the real, real world and there's certainly interest that it can be picked up in the popular press and things like that. Those aren't my personal motivation somehow there's an inherent beauty about prime numbers um, that's always what really motivates me to try and understand the mysteries of these seemingly very simple but actually very complicated objects. But you don't get pressures. It's not like a boss will come up and say, you know, James, it would be really good for us if uh, the number two came from here. Um, I've certainly not had anyone come up and <laughs> try and get the enforcers to make me bring the gap down. Uh, so I've not felt any pressure myself. I can't speak for others. Which one would you most like to see solved? Which one would excite you the most? I think the Riemann hypothesis would be the first choice for most number theorists um, in terms of if you want a problem on prime numbers, the Riemann hypothesis just automatically proves about a million other theorems straight away, just off the bat. There's all these theorems that say, if the Riemann hypothesis is true, then this. And so you automatically prove a million other theorems just with this. And we have this huge new understanding that even more than the Riemann hypothesis as a result, the proof and the ideas in the proof that prove the Riemann hypothesis inherently must get such a good understanding of prime numbers that we will have this whole new way of looking about prime numbers, I would guess, if someone was able to prove the Riemann hypothesis and this whole new technique that would open up all kinds of new possibilities. So, yeah, if I had to choose one, it would be the Riemann hypothesis. Does the Riemann hypothesis ever get any of your brain time? Um, I like to sometimes think about some questions connected to the Riemann hypothesis, uh, but the Riemann hypothesis itself, um, I feel I have no good intuitive way of even starting to how to attack that kind of problem. But there's lots of smaller problems connected to the Riemann hypothesis that are very important for prime numbers, and those are things that I'm very interested in and certainly think about quite a lot, yeah. Likely to find your, um, you know, your true love, because the prime numbers are so far apart at that large end of things. So it's a pretty loveless place, you know, at that end of things. So you go to bigger and bigger numbers, you might think there's just no way you're going to find your true love.